Hey folks, welcome back for another episode of Code Club. In recent episodes, I've been looking at a variety of different data structures and trying to figure out what is the best way, the fastest way, to build that structure and then get access to the values in that data structure. This is part of an overall project that I'm working on to build a sequence classifier uh, for a new R package that I'm trying to develop. One of the problems that I ran into is that I tried to represent my data, um, which is a set of KMERS. So if you wanna know what all this jargon means, I'll put a link to the playlist up above here. Basically what I have is a matrix where my rows are one of 65,000 possible eight MERS and the columns are one of several thousand possible genera or types of bacteria, if you will. You don't need to know any microbiology to understand what I'm doing here. But what happened when I built that that matrix was that it blew up my computer, basically. It exhausted the RAM, the amount of space that R was willing to dedicate to that matrix. What I realized was that most of the values in that matrix were zeros, which means I don't need to store that, which means that that matrix is what we call sparse. And so again, we've been thinking about different ways to build ways to represent that matrix. In the last episode, what I did was I showed you, I think like 18 or 19 different ways to represent sparse data. And what we found was that representing the data as vectors was the, the quickest way to generate uh, those data structures. Actually things like tibbles and data tables um, were much slower to build than an ordinary data frame or certainly a list or a, a set of vectors. But just because things are fast to build doesn't mean they're fast to get access to, right? So we, something could be blazingly fast to build, but it could be a pain to work with. It could actually be really slow to pull a value out of that. So that's what we're gonna do in today's episode. We're going to revisit that really long episode from last time, and we're gonna focus on getting values out of the structures to uh, figure out, let's say, what KMERS and what, what, how many sequences in each of those genera that the KMER was found in um, were, were, were represented in our, in our data, right? So that's, again, part of the motivation. Along the way, what you'll see is a variety of different ways to get data out of uh, data frames, data tables, tibbles, uh, lists, vectors, and, and on and on. <laughs> so strap in uh, and get ready for what will hopefully be a, a shorter and a, a bit fun uh, exp exploration of performance of accessing values from some fairly complicated data structures. So I have my benchmarking df.r script opened up here in R Studio. I've gone ahead and loaded everything. Um, and again, just to kind of refresh our memory of the different functions that I had to build roughly the same structure, um, the same data being represented in slightly different ways, but by these 18 different approaches. Um, this matrix predefined is the full matrix. The case that I'm using here is uh, 64 KMERS by 15 genera, and I'm representing 100 sequences. Again, this is kind of a toy example to allow us to do some benchmarking and, and playing with the data. And clearly what we saw was that representing the data as three vectors, not as a data frame, was much faster, whereas representing things as a tibble, these things that start with a TBL, were, were much slower. But that data frames and data tables actually did pretty well, and there wasn't much of a benefit for writing this in C++, and that's most likely because the RCPP version of a data frame is probably the same thing as what R is using also in, in C. So what I wanna to do today is generate a tibble, a data table, a matrix, a sparse matrix, um, a list, a vector, all these different structures, and see how they perform for pulling out the same data from each of them. So the first one I'm gonna do is df, and we'll do df predefine um, on n, and I'm going to define n here uh, for these cases as 1,000. Previously, I used 100. Uh, I'm gonna try 1,000 to make sure that I get all of the KMERS represented, um, at least in one ge genus. Uh, n is the number of sequences that we're sampling. And so now if we look at df, we see that we get this data frame, right? Um, and yeah, there we go. Um, and so we see that it's not ordered by any means, uh, but that we get the, the camera, the genus, the count, um, and, and that's basically what we're going for here. All right, so that's data frame. Uh, we can think about data table. This is using the data.table package. Uh, again, dt has a slightly different representation. Um, we can also think about the tibble. 
And so we'll call that TBL. And then we had TBL predefined. And again, TBL, oh, TBL. We get that representation, so that's cool. I'll also have M full for a full matrix. And so we'll call that then matrix predefined uh, with N. And again, M full looks like this. It's a 64 by 15 column uh, matrix, cool. And then we'll also do M sparse. Uh, and I wanna make sure I get the right, the, the more efficient version of the sparse matrix, which I may have lost here. Uh, there we go. Um, so let's see, where was sparse? So sparse R, T, and there's C, right? So I think what we found was that R and T performed about the same. I'm gonna do T, and so that's compress compressing it into triplets. Uh, so we'll go ahead and use that. And again, M sparse looks like this. Again, the dots in this are zero values. I'll also do list predefine N, and this is gonna be, um, I'll call it LST. So we have six different structures representing the same type of data. Um, from this list version, we will get the vector-based approach. I wanna do my best to make sure that we get the same um, data represented in each of these. So I'm going to reset the seed before each of these. So we'll do set.seed. And then my favorite uh, seed is 1976-06-20. This is my birthday. <laughs> um, I have actually gotten uh, happy birthday uh, comments from people because they, they know this, right? So um, I appreciate people recognizing my birthday. So we'll go ahead and run these and get those loaded. And so if we do like head on DF and then head on TBL, that's probably not really necessary. We see that we get the same type of data out of each of these. It's not critical that it's exact, but I want it to at least be pretty close. All right, so now we have these six different ways of generating the data. Now we wanna think about how do we get access to those data? So I'm gonna start with DF. The first column is the KMERS, the second is the genus, and then the third is the number of sequences that had that KMER in that genus. Again, this is all make-believe random data, but it's there to kind of illustrate some points. Okay. So what we'll do with DF is if I want to get the rows corresponding to a specific KMER, then I can do DF with square braces, and we're going to go into a row, and I talked about this in the last episode a bit, so I can do DF dollar sign KMER equals equals 20, and this then returns all of the rows from my data frame that had KMER 20, right? Cool. So I will go ahead and call this get df single and we'll have that as a function and I'm not going to have any arguments going into it. So eventually we'll come back and we'll look at getting maybe three values out of the data frame but for now let's just stick with single. I'm going to repeat this then for the other types of structures. So df dt uh, will be the data table and I actually don't need this type of notation inside of it. This is basically saying, give us the rows where the, the KMER column from DF equals 20. And so DT is smart enough to do that on its own, as you can see here. So this is get DT single. Uh, we'll also do get TBL single uh, function. And then we'll do TBL. And again, uh, we had this as our table, right, Tibble? And normally what you might do would be like a filter um, and actually we can write this in one line without the pipe because I know the pipe can cause <laughs> concern whether or not the magnetor pipe or the base pipe performs better. So let's just remove that variable and we'll do filter TBL and then we'll say KMER equals equals 20. And so we can see we get that output. So that's cool. And then we'll do get M full single function and that is again m full right so we'll do m full and so this is a full matrix and so if i give it the row so if i give it 20 so this will give us the counts and the position then is the genus indication you can see we've got the zeros in here um, again this is from a full matrix which we already know we can't really do because we can't store the full matrix right so this is an example of where it's blazingly fast to get the data but we can't actually build the data set right um, we might have other cases where it's blazingly fast to build the data structure, but painfully slow 
to get the data out, right? And so that's why we do these types of analyses, and we then discuss the trade-offs and, and think through things, right? So um, m full single, so we also have m sparse uh, single, and so we'll, we'll call that m sparse here. And so that is the same output as we saw before. So out of the list, I'm going to pull the vectors. So I will then do kmer vec, uh, and that's gonna be LST dollar sign kmer. I'll also do genus vec as LST dollar sign genus, and then we'll do count vec uh, LST dollar sign count. And so let's make sure these are all loaded. And then what we would do is get the the values from each of those, right? And so we could do like kmer vec um, 20. Uh, and so we don't need the comma, right? And so that would then give us, well, no, that's right. <laughs> ah, I'm thinking, I'm going so quickly through these things that I just got in the mindset that we wanted kmer 20 kind of like from a matrix, but really we want all the kmers that are equal to 20, right? And so basically, if we look at kmer vec, then we wanna know which of these are equal to 20. So I could do equals equals 20. And then this gives us a series of trues and false values. Uh, and we've got like a thousand here, right? Um, and so what I'd like to do, I, so I could, I, could, I could do this, right? I could do kmer vec on this, and then I could repeat this for genus vec and count vec, right? But I'm gonna be searching through my kmer vec three times to find those that are equal to 20. And so I can see that being slow. What I'd rather do, well, so so I could certainly save this um, as um, kmer present, right? And then I could save that, and then I could put kmer present into all these, right? And get those values, right? So that's one approach. Um, another approach would be to say, um, to take, uh, to take this again, so I'm gonna copy these, right? And then this, I'll do which on that to return which elements have a kmer value of 20, right? And so now when I look at this, I get the same result, but I'm doing it by slightly different approach. And so I'm kind of curious which one performs the best, right? We'll call this get vector single function on that. And I'm leaving, the vector definition outside because that's how I'm kind of envisioning the data structure being stored. And then I'll also do get vector, um, or get, let me say which, single with function, right? And then I'll tab this over and close that out. Um, and I think what I'll ultimately wanna do is perhaps create a new list as output. So we'll do list on this with kmer equals that. All right, that, and then count equals that, close that out. And so then I'll, I'll copy this down and replace these uh, because R can only return a single object. And so what it's gonna return then is the list. It, you can't give it three vectors to return, right? So um, we'll go ahead and do that. And so these are, um, I don't know, a bunch of different ways to get um, all the rows where kmer vector is 20. And so let's go ahead and do micro benchmark. And then we'll, we'll, we'll put these in here. Um, so get df single, get dt single, get tbl single, get m full and get m smart. M sparse single. And right, and then we have these two vector ones, get vector single and get which single. The parentheses are doing weird things. Uh, so we'll go ahead and do that. And I'm gonna go ahead and grab the dplyr code that I had up here, which takes the output from microbenchmark and it, it, I think summarizes it in a nicer way than the default output. We'll go ahead and run this. Oh, and I've got, of course, load all my functions because I generated all these functions and then forgot to load them. So we'll do that. And so what we find is that, of course, taking a full matrix and grabbing the row is the fastest way. Um, a vector with the single where we are using 
the uh, logical vector, or basically generating a logical vector of trues and falses, and then using that to go into our vector is faster than using which. Um, and so, yeah, accessing it via a vector via versus, so accessing it via a vector of logicals is faster than generating the indices where those things are true, and then indexing that into the vector um, is slower than just straight up logical, right? Which is interesting. Um, DF single is faster than any of these other approaches, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, faster than the sparse, the tibble, or the data table. I still find that really, really interesting. Um, so this is getting a single camer out. So we might think now about getting three values out. I don't know why three, but you're just some number larger than one. So what we'll do is we'll come back up to these and I'm gonna go ahead and do um, DF3. And let's see, let's go ahead and just, and I'll define this using an or operator. So we'll do or uh, DF camera equals, um, let's do 30. And then we'll also do uh, 50, okay? And so again, this then will give us all the rows with 20, 30, or 50. We'll also repeat this for DT. And then we'll, um, again, kind of the same idea of copying these three in um, here. And we'll call this DT3 and remove our DF dollar signs here, right? All right. And so that's good. So now we need a tibble. And then we'll grab this from the data table and put this in here. Cool. And then our M full single, uh, we'll uh, do three. And I forgot to change this one to three. Thank you. I heard you. That was great. Appreciate the participation. And then here we'll do uh, C20, comma 30, uh, 30, 50. All right. Just double check that works. So that gives us three rows out of that matrix. Cool. And then uh, M sparse tr three, right? And so here we'll do the same type of idea. I wanna double check that this, oh, we need the comma. So that works also for indexing into a sparse matrix. Cool. And then we want um, get vector three with this. And so of course we need um, what? Yeah, so we need the 30 and the 50. So maybe I'll go ahead and copy this and we'll change this to the 30 and 50. So let's get vector three. Um, yeah, I think that works. We see here in our Kmer vector, we've got all those, cool. And then we also wanna try the which with three, get which three. And we'll go ahead and grab this logic and bring it down here. So I'm gonna go ahead and load all these functions. We have so many functions. Uh, and thankfully we can compare them head to head against each other. So I'll go ahead and copy this. And instead of these singles, we'll make it three. So I'll go ahead and copy and paste these in and I'll be right back. All right, so let's go ahead and give this a run now. So again, what I'm trying to do here is get a sense of how the performance scales with the number of kmers that I'm trying to pull back, right? And so we we saw this in a previous episode, how we could go ahead and generate a plot with kind of n across the x-axis and time required on the y-axis. And then we could kind of plot each of these and see what the lines looked like. I'm not overly concerned with that because um, yeah, I just, you can do that. <laughs> I'll let you do that, right? Um, and, and so I think what we see though, is that uh, like, so here's the single and the three, and it takes twice as long to get three as it takes to get one um, with by vector. Using the which is again about twice as long. Um, using a data frame actually uh, scales better than it appears that using a vector does. Um, the sparse um, is again twice. Uh, the data table uh, is like eightfold. So that, that might actually be uh, more like quadratic, I'm not sure. Uh, and the tibble is also quite slow. Um, so, so that's that's interesting. Uh, ultimately, I think what we find is that the method that performed the best for building was the vector, <laughs> and the method that performs the best for getting the values out is also gonna be the vector. One thing that I wanna go back to here, though, 
is that when we are doing a search like this, we are um, using an or operator, right? If I wanted to get like 10 things back, this would be kind of tedious to write out, yeah? And so an alternative that I often use is the in operator, okay? So I'm gonna go and use the vector approach and I will do get vector three and I'm gonna call this or uh, and I'm gonna put that down here before I forget uh, or uh, because the vertical lines indicate or, right? And so here I'll use in and I'll do is go ahead and um, we'll, we'll do this a slightly different way. So I'll do kmer vec in, so it's percent in percent, and then we can give it a vector of values. So I'll do 20, 30, and 50. And so this is asking what values in kmer vec are in 20, 30, and 50. And so this then will give us kmer present. And again, it's a logical, right? So this will feed very nicely into the rest of what we're doing. So let's go ahead and add this to our pipeline and I will make sure that it's loaded. All right, and then we'll go ahead and after the get vector three, uh, we'll do the in. So here is our or and our in. And again, to get the same number of kmers out, the same data out, the or operator performs a lot better than the in operator, which is really interesting. <laughs> I'm not totally sure how that in operator works, but it's certainly intriguing that um, it performs so much better. So a problem with using these ors is that, say I don't know what values I'm gonna want, right? Or say I've got like 20 values. This could get kind of tedious, <laughs> right? Um, and so I'm going to build off of this. So we can imagine having these three values like we've already seen, right? And so that gives us those. And what we might like to do would be like a paste where we then say kmer equals equals that, like that, right? And so that gives us our kmers and what we want them to be equal to, right? And But then we need to kind of paste them together further to put the pipe operator in there, right? So we could then do another paste on that. And then what we could do is collapse equals the vertical line, right? Oh, and I forgot a closing parentheses there. And so there we go, we've got that closing parenthesis um, like that. And yep, yeah, there we go. So this is um, one way of doing it, right? And so what we could imagine doing is taking this and calling this, uh, what do I call here, kmer present, right? So this could be my kmer present. And let's get some more real estate here so we can see what we're doing. And then I could do like kmer, kmer present, right? And so we could hope this would work but this doesn't work. Oh, this needs to be kmer vec, right? All right, that's why it doesn't work. That's why it doesn't work, because I used the wrong variable. Okay, that also doesn't work. <laughs> so anyway, this is a string, as we've seen, right? And so we need to convert this string to our language. And so what we could do is str to lang on that. And so let's see what this outputs, right? And so that gives us this. And so I still don't think this is enough to get it in there, right? So uh, it's complaining because it says kmer not found. This should be kmer underscore vec. That works. And now we do kmer present and we get our logicals, right? So again, what's happening is that in here, we are building the query, right, as a string. And then with string to lang, we're converting it to r, right? And then we're saying we want r to evaluate that, right? And so it makes sense if you take it piece by piece. Uh, this is one of the downsides of base R is that you can see we've got one, two, three, four functions nested inside of each other. <laughs> that gets a little bit overwhelming and a bit confusing, right? Um, so if, if I were putting this into production code, so to speak, I'd probably break this up into using like the base R pipe to make it easier to see what exactly is going on here. But um, again, then we feed that into Kmer vec and we get 20, 30, and 50. So I want to try this with string to long. So I will go ahead and uh, create a new function that I'll call get vector uh, str to lang, not long, uh, function, um, and see how this performs relative to doing uh, the or operator. Because again, we could imagine having, having um, many more 
um, kmers that we want to get back. So I'll go ahead and load this and add this to my pipeline. And let's see how this performs. Oh, and I forgot my parentheses here. So it's interesting to me that string to lang, that approach actually does worse, <laughs> you know, algorithmically developing our query. Um, it does worse than any of our other options with the get vector, whether it's using the in operator or the or operator. Um, that's, that's really disturbing in a way. Um, I'm noticing that like my get vector single at six, you know, 5,800 seconds, nanoseconds, I think it was, um, actually I could run this three times and it would be faster than using the in operator or the string to lang operator. Um, that's really interesting. <laughs> I don't know what to do with that. I guess what this is telling me is that if I had to look for three kmers from a vector, I would need to run it three times. Um, and it would still perform better than some of these other available approaches. Um, that's interesting. I, I don't quite believe that, um, but maybe maybe it's it, that's what the data show. So if I'm missing something, please let me know down below in the comments. One other way of filtering the data that I'm interested in trying um, at this point, I think is not necessary to look at, but I want to do it anyway, and that is to do a join. Um, and so with like a tibble, you know, we could create a data frame that has the three names of the three kmers I'm interested in, and then we could do an inner join with that to get back the rows from the tibble that we're interested in. I'm curious how this performs. I'm only going to try it with the tibble, um, but that, that should tell us enough to kind of get an idea of how that would perform with other things, right? And so I'll grab this and we'll do git tibble three uh, join. I'll put a J, a tibble, and I'll say kmer equals, uh, we'll do 20, 30, and 50. And I'll call this my filter table. I guess I could call it filter tibble, but whatever. Um, we won't do that. And then what we can do is inner join TBL with filter table by equals kmer. This then will get us those rows that correspond to 20, 30, and 50. And then we'll output that. And yeah, so we'll go ahead and add git tibble j. Um, let's see, we'll maybe put it right there. All right, and we'll go ahead and run that and see how long that takes. And yeah, sure enough, <laughs> that's really slow. Oh my gosh, that's surprising to me. So filtering with a join, at least with a tibble, is much slower than um, using an or operator and probably much slower than using which or any of those types of things. So again, that's really interesting to me. Um, again, thinking about some of these, comparing the single to the three, well, I guess, yeah, single to the three here for a tibble takes the same amount of time, which is interesting, of course. Um, and then the data table with one is slower than the data table with three. I don't understand. Um, if you know something about that, let me know. But that's that's interesting, okay? Um, and of course, the mParse single, or msparse single, is also slower than msparse three, which also doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I don't really know what to make of that. Um, at least the the, the data frame three and single makes sense. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty interesting. I think what would be helpful in a case like this, if you wanted to study it further, with the data tables at least, would be to, again, increase the number of kmers that you tried to get out of the data, right? So go from like one to 64 for each of these methods and then generate a plot to see how it scales. I'm not gonna do that because I think I know what I need to do. I need to work with vectors and perhaps doing um, one kmer at a time and just kind of looping that. This might be something that I come back to later to see like what, if I need to get multiple kmers out, what's the fastest way to do that? But for now, I think I'm gonna be pretty satisfied to stick with vectors and not pursue any type of the other data frames or sparse matrix representations of the data further. Um, this has been really eye-opening to me. And in hindsight, it makes a lot of sense that when you have a data frame, you are having a list, again, where each column is a different vector and there are there's overhead to representing the data as a data frame where you're, you're packaging those three objects together. Uh, there's a little bit of overhead with a list, just a vanilla list, 
but not much at all. There's also overhead with representing it as a matrix. Uh, the overhead with the matrix, of course, is memory, but also it's a vector that you then provide um, dimensions for rows and columns. The sparse matrix also has overhead because under the hood, it's really a data frame that they add extra stuff on to make it look more attractive, more like an actual matrix, even though it's not storing it as an actual matrix. So I think it's important to think about, you know, what do you get for these different types of structures that you could do everything with a vector and a list, uh, as we talked about before, an atomic vector and a list vector. Uh, those are both types of vectors. Um, and when we're doing day-to-day -day data analysis, like you might be doing if you're getting data and you're trying to build a plot for a figure in a paper or something like that, you're, you're cool to deal with this overhead because you don't notice the overhead. It goes by so fast that you don't notice it. But again, we are going to be looking up KMERS like this operation thousands of times for uh, perhaps a single sequence. And so that needs to be fast. And we don't want that to, to, be, to be laggy, right? And so like a difference in tens of thousands of nanoseconds, <laughs> right, is, is again, microseconds or milliseconds, but again, scaled over thousands of times gets to be seconds. And that gets to be like real time. And so these are all things to consider. Again, the trade-offs are different when you're doing a data analysis versus when you're programming and trying to build a package that other people are going to use. If it's harder for me to code, but easier for you to use, that's a win, right? If it's easier for me to code, but harder for you to use, that's a loss. And so these again are the trade-offs that we need to keep in mind. All right, so in the next episode, we're gonna to try to make sense of all this information as we go forward and thinking about the rest of our package development so that you don't miss that exciting episode. Please make sure you've subscribed to the channel and we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.